How you been? Oh, well. Really? Yes. It's Man, it is uh, difficult navigating traffic. You know, really today. Literal I, traffic or metaphorical traffic? Wow. Because like you're a songwriter, you know? I, I never know what know. level you're coming at me. Um, I would say today, literally. <laughs> it was bad. Just getting through Green Hills or anywhere was <laughs> quite challenging. But I'm also working on gratitude. I'm not going to work on it. I was thinking, <clears throat> there's a lot of complaint boxes. Mm-hmm. I need to put up a gratitude box. That's what I need to put up for me. Is this to... uh, a new effort of gratitude for you? It is an uncommon effort. It is. It does not come naturally to me. I, you know, I, I guess I, I don't really. I. I, I don't it doesn't to me either. So when yeah, you, I'm the same. I think that's the human condition. We gravitate towards. I, I belong to this little tennis club and we've just built an indoor facility and it's just it's ironic that the first two or three like the first week everybody's kind of in the honeymoon and then all of a sudden after a week the complaints start coming out where before we were like oh if we could only play inside you know because it's raining and it's cold but now we can play inside but now we start finding faults so i was just thinking what we need is a gratitude thankful thankful box not a complaint box or at least if you do put in a complaint, you must also yes. include one thing that you're grateful for. I do find that, because I struggle with gratitude in general within myself. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful for people that stick their neck out for me and help me. And, yeah. But it does get lost sometimes because I'm so assigned to the next thing that I haven't been able to get. I'm obsessed with it, which is a bit of a blinder. Because when my obsession kicks in, I'm working so hard to get to that next thing that I forget all the things that allow me to get to where I am now. Yeah. So I need the reminders. And I do an okay job, but I'm not a natural gratitude guy. I'm right. very happy. I'm very grateful. But just living a life of gratitude, right. I struggle with that, especially when it's gratitude within myself. What What's happened with you to make you see that your perspective was not indicative of who you wanted to be this recent gratitude recent gratitude well i think it's a number of things one is i turn 70 you're 70 years old next month i would have not put you over 60 61 62 you would have not put me over 69 and a half thank you Bob. Well, that's man. why you get the big bucks right there <laughs> well i didn't say 40 you did not say 40 so the older you get, I, the older I get, I think I become more and more aware of the uh, some of the toxic aspects of my personality. And um, what, like what? And I can always lead you and tell you my toxic things. It's, it's, you know, I think it's a- yeah. I mean, it's it's jealousy, insecurity. Well, I'm wildly insecure. I'm wildly insecure, yeah. incredibly insecure. Yeah. Uh, rage, lust, um, you know, you you name it, and it's. Um, but I, at the risk of having a catch-all, I really do think when I focus, I mean, those things you almost can't arrest them in your personality. But what I can do is focus on something, uh, you know like gratitude, like love, like faith, like, you know, my relationship with God. Those things, the toxic aspects of my personality tend to start to fall away. They lose their grip if I focus on, uh, I'm just grateful that, you know, I can be here. I'm grateful that, you know, I got a car that I can drive. I'm grateful that I live in America. It's, I mean, it, 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 I know it sounds cliche, but honestly, it does rescue you from wallowing in, um, you know, bitterness and cynicism. I mean, I think that's what we see so much in the culture. You just see that the disappointment and the cynicism and the critics. and Well, because it's clickable. It's clickable, yeah. Uh, polar opinions are what create gravitation. Yeah. Everything lands on things that are dynamic and especially now in the news culture and yeah, it's very toxic because they know all these companies know what we're all going to click on 
and it's something dynamic and most of the stuff that's dynamic is because it's yeah. so negative and so right. polar you know it's kind of a weird culture that we've built and that we're mad at but yet we still contribute to yeah myself included yeah if there's a story like, ah, she hey, well, had this to say, she's so right. angry. Well, let me just see what she has to say. Yes, yeah, right. Well, we are politically, we're, and I think they do manipulate us, whoever they are. We're drawn together by the things we hate, not the things that we love. Especially now. And that's not, that is not who America is. Yeah, that's that, right. that, It's just not. And we have fallen into that. Um, but, you know, as a transition, I really do think art, in a way, can help rescue us from... You know, those, some of those feelings that, that, you know, are not, are not, uh, you know, historically who we are, you know, as a culture, as a nation. And I don't want to get dark here, but it's going to uh, at least wade in that water a little bit where I've had some health issues over the past five years that I really haven't talked about publicly, but have been, is really bad for a while. Mm. To the point where it was the first time that I really started to question, not question, but even consider that I might not live forever mm -hmm. because it was some real serious stuff. And I'd had a couple issues where I had been jumped, I had a gun to my head and these crazy things that happened, like mm. security things, which is way different because security things I can kind of control. Yeah. Not all. I don't have full control over it, but now I have full-time security. If I'm public, the company makes I have, like, my guy's been with me now for, like, eight years. Everywhere I go, he goes. And it's weird. And sometimes I feel like a loser because I hate being seen with that or as that. And I ask him not to stay, you know, which I, right. can, I can somewhat control those walls. Health, I, I can't. Yeah. I And I can do things now to make. But I had these really, just really crazy few years. And I started to go, I'm not, I'm not, wow, I'm not, I'm not going to live forever. And we know we're not going to live forever. Right. But until we start to, like, feel that we're not going to live together, it's all... So mortality has been something that I've been thinking about. And you mentioned you're about to be 70 and it's shifting you. Does that 70th birthday, is that something that starts to drag in on you? And it's not a health thing. It's just you're getting older. I'm getting older. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to do, and we'll see if it's successful, time will tell, is you, you have to, I am trying to look at that as as a real positive there are many many benefits to getting older I, honestly i think there are many more benefits to getting older than there are being younger i just stay injured all the time though ever <laughs> since i got 40 if i if anything dinks up <laughs> it stays for longer and when it gets yeah. cold it hurts again right yeah other than that all good that that's that that is one of the downsides <laughs> but the, the there's a sense of of uh you realize the fragile veil. That's really what you're discussing. I mean, and then when you come face to face with a fragile veil of your own health or the health of those that you love, it is, uh, I mean, it takes your breath away all of a sudden. So I, I think what I'm, I really, I'm trying to operate in this space of there's clarity that comes mm. with getting older. I just don't have, I don't literally or metaphorically, I don't have as much time to fritter away. I've wasted a lot of time in my life. And I really, I really do regret that. That that is a regret. I have not been as focused as I wish that I were. When is that foc that lack of focus? It was it early? Was it when you got away from writing? When you came back? Is there a specific non focused season of your life or just generally do you wish you would have focused more? I think kind of just, you know, during the during the day, it's uh, like every day, like every day. It's just I mean, there are just there can just be, you know, hours that are just lost. And uh, so I, I guess the only remedy for that for me is to uh, really think about the time that I have left and, and not 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 what's lost or what I have frittered away. But I really do want to be intentional about the time that I have and and make some decisions. OK. God willing, this is, let's say I have, I don't know. 25 years. Well, could be. I mean, I, I, you're still, I heard you're number one in the world tennis. I am. Nashville of the new <laughs> club that has a roof. <laughs> I am the most average mediocre tennis player you have ever met. It's, it's incredible. I've spent millions of dollars trying to be a better tennis player. So that's your, that, that's your sport, your passion, your hobby. I have always loved tennis because I think, uh, to me, it's it's really very poetic, 
it's what what aspect if you see roger federer on the green lawn of wimbledon it's to me if you don't see that as poetry in motion then i need to get your i need to get the fog of off your your glasses it's it's just it's a very poetic beautiful sport she plays kid i have i've played since you know i was like eight or nine so you you were exposed to it early i was yeah we did we didn't have tennis where i grew up and so I would see it on TV, and I would see Sampras. And I'm a massive sports guy now, and I do a sports show as well, but I would see Sampras, the American guys, Chang, yeah. then Agassi, yes. uh, young Andy Roddick, and I moved to Austin, Texas. I lived there for like 12 years, and again, didn't know anything about tennis, except I would watch the majors. Yeah. And I got a call from Andy Roddick once. He said, I'm doing a charity event. It was his sister. He said, he's doing a charity event. Um, he's a big fan of your show. Would you mind doing this charity event with him? I said, yeah, sure. So I go, and when I'm not on, I'm way off. Like, I have, you put me on stage, do stand-up, let's go, TV show, go, radio, go. But when it's not that, extremely reserved, very shy to the point where people are like, well, he's not being who he normally is, so he's a jerk. It's just <laughs> a very quiet person. You're an introvert. I'm a so introverted, yeah. selective extrovert, and yeah. extremely extroverted when it's that time. Wow, selective extrovert. Extrovert. I've never heard that. Well, yeah, I, I select that. to get paid, so I do. Yes. Uh, extra, yeah. Okay. So I do the charity event with Andy, and Andy's the same way, like very private until, but he's um, publicly super funny, obnoxious, loud. So we kind of struck up a mild friendship, and we hung out more and more. And I'll smash cut this. He he was in my wedding. He's my best friends now in life. You're kidding, Andy Roddick? I talked. I mean, I talked to him this morning. Like he's been one of my best life friends. Wow. Like if he called, needed a kidney. I wouldn't think twice about it. Like, there's like four of those people. And so when we were in Austin, and I would travel with them to events, and like we were tight because neither one of us had big circles and we were we trusted yeah. each other. And so he had to deal with, obviously, any tennis or sports company that he wanted, and he would give me the absolute best of the best equipment. Wow. Rackets, shoes, balls. It doesn't matter. Machine, everything just what he'd want whenever he wanted. And I was like, I don't know how to play tennis. And he was like, well, start playing. And I just got like four or five of my friends, and I'm like, okay, we're going to start playing, but they all need stuff too. He <laughs> he fitted us all with, I mean, we had thousands and thousands no of equipment. No kidding. And I'm going to tell you, Tom, we sucked. We never got better because we never wanted, I mean, we just played each other. Right. And I'm not even sure we played with the right rules. But that was my tennis is that I thought our group is pretty good. So I told Andy one day, I said, I think if at the time he had held the world record for fastest serve. And he was like a touring artist, but touring in the rock space where he would be gone in Europe for three months. Yeah. We don't text or call occasionally, but when he'd come home, we were together a lot. And he'd come back, and I said, when you come back, I'm getting pretty good at this. I was only beating my friends. <laughs> I said, well, I'm getting pretty good at this. I want to I want to hit some with you. And he was like, okay. So he had the world record for serve. I said, I think if you hit your ball at me 10 times, I could at least put it back over the net once. Right. He goes, you can't. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not saying I would... Score point, but I think once. Right. And he's like, all right. He said, you can't, but okay. So we do it. And he goes, if you do this, though, I need you to document it because you're not going to be able to. You're not. And I know me. I can do anything pump my mind to. So I'm, I'm training, but only against my friends that suck, right? Right. And we meet up, and he's ready. And I got my – and Sports Illustrated was doing a thing on it. And I'm like, let's go, baby. And he hits the first one. I don't even I – don't, I don't see it. I didn't see it. I, yeah. I, didn't, I, mean, I was like – I think I heard something. <laughs> and he had a couple more, and he knew I had no chance. So then he started to, like, cut the serves. Right. Where they would come a little slower, but they would just, like, hard sliders. <laughs> Gone. And then he just started tagging me with the ball yeah. off the ground. And that's when I realized tennis is not for me. I can't see very well because right. one of my eyes doesn't work. And I just – I don't have it. I never had it. So the fact that you're a big tennis player, there's so much running and cardio and yeah. being in shape. Like, that's, that's a great sport to be a fan of because you would kind of stay fit yeah, and it would keep you pretty healthy. Do you find that's a big part of your health and your fitness now as being uh, dedicated to tennis? Well, I mean, I, I, I play, you know, two or three times a week. Wow. That is a lot. So it's, well, it's a lot. I mean, I take a couple of lessons and I got, you know, guys that we play with. Uh, are you, are you good in your group? Your person? I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm not being modest. I, I am. I, even at at my level, I guys I play with guys fifty to seventy. It it still is amazing that you can look at you know 
guys that are doing athletic things. And some guys just have, even at our level, they just have a greater gift yeah. of eye-hand coordination than the other guy. I mean, now, Andy Roddick is oh, you it, know, it, an exponential. It, it's, it pissed you off. It's crazy. I hated him. It's Superman. Yeah, the hand-eye coordination thing, because he, he trained and I would work out with him, and it was tough, and I get it. He's also a lot bigger than you think. Super athlete, but we play ping pong. He's awesome. We play golf. I started playing golf. I haven't played golf a long time in my life, but I started playing a little bit before him. And he went from being a terrible golfer to <clears throat> an awesome golfer in like nine months. Yeah. I'm still trying to get there. Right. Yeah, so, there. But when we talk about gifts, natural gifts, where do you feel like your natural gift is being used the most in your career? Like what makes you – and I'm going to use the word. You don't have to agree with the word, but please, for the sake of this question – based on your data, your stats, what makes you elite as a songwriter as far as where your gifts come into play? I think I... Well, I I think we all uh, possess a superpower. And I would say that my superpower would be If I had to just name one, it would probably be empathy. I can really put myself uh, in the shoes of uh, almost anybody. It's you know, it's kind of the storyteller aspect of me. I, I, I'm very, I am very interested in people, and uh, I really feel things deeply. Like no matter, no matter what, I feel stories deeply. Movies. Uh, you get emotional quick. Yeah, I'm very emotional. Yes, very emotional. My wife's, so, my wife's an empath. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Right, it, but you're not. Um, you know, I, I am a situational empath. I'm not an emotional empath because I struggle with emotion. I think I went through so much big time trauma. My age 1 to 17, 18, that I never let myself be that sad so I never got that happy. Yeah, I never was excited about anything because I was always disappointed. So never too high, never too low. And but if I, I since if I can't get that sad, I also can't go that high, right? Right. And I don't like that about me. Yeah. So I don't have that emotion. I'm working on it. My wife's been such a good influence there. But I have situational because anything that I've even kind of been through, and I see somebody else going through it, I just want I want to fix everything. Yeah. And but I can do it very linear, and just fix it and not. It's like a trauma surgeon mm. who goes, and somebody's like dying, but they're able to focus and go, all right, this is why I'm here. Let me fix it. And yes, it's a very emotional thing, but right. they can go, if I am not collected, I will not be able to do this as efficient as possible. Right. So yes, I'm, in, I'm a uh, situational empath. I have no emotion. But when it hits me, God dang. Yeah. Because it never hits. But when it hits, it's right. like you pulled the plug of the bathtub and the water's been in there for eight months or so. But that's why I think I'll, I enjoy you as a songwriter so much. Either if you're singing them in a demo that I hear, or a version that you've cut, or artists that you write with or artists that you just write for, I think universally most of your songs have an empathy to them mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah. And I, when you said empathy, I was, was going to bring that up and, and your style and even your movie, which, I mean, I watched two, three years ago at this point. It's so good. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't... I love you. I, I, as someone who's created your body of work and even the amount of time we've spent together, which isn't a ton, but it's enough that I feel like when you walked in again, I was like, dude, it's great to see you again. Yeah. Like I, I watched that movie. And maybe that's part of it too is watching that movie and, and, yeah. and getting to know you even better because people feel like they know me because I volunteer a lot of my life to them. But I watched your movie and I honestly, when it started... I'm gonna be completely transparent with you. This will, this will be painful. I'm getting this. No, is, this but it gonna, ends up. It's like a workout. It's gonna be a backhanded compliment. It's like a workout because it's okay. gonna be great at the end. Okay. I was like, oh man, I don't want to watch some songwriters' glory piece where they think right. they can do a movie about. Like, okay, we know you wrote a bunch of great songs. I love the songs, but you're gonna do a movie now. Right. Like, and it wasn't about you. It's just that's what I would have felt with anybody. Yeah. It's a massive songwriter going. I made a movie about my songs in my life. Right. But I 
am such a big fan of you. And I said, you know what? I owe it to me because I like Tom so much to watch it. And I started it. Unorthodox style. You're talking to the, and you're moving through. And it took me a second. It was almost like when I watched Hamilton. I didn't really know what I was getting into. Right. And it took me a minute to catch on. Oh, they never stopped. Oh, oh. And then I freaking loved it. Once I assigned myself to the idea of what I was watching. Yeah. And it was about probably 12 to 13 minutes into your movie that I went, oh, I'm not weirded out. And as a matter of fact, I am enthralled. I loved it so much. I remember writing a note. And I had to keep myself from writing a note to you or to somebody on your team immediately after it was so good, I couldn't stop telling people about it. They're like, "Where'd I watch it?" I was like, "I don't know." He sent me a link. Right. I was like, "I don't." So when it came on Paramount, which is where it's at now, and right. I was talking about it, who Mike? Who was I talking about it with? Je- uh, somebody. Warren Brothers. The yeah, the Warren Brothers. Yeah. I was like, I got to get Tom back on because you, people can now see this now. <laughs> right. yeah. When you make this, just the style of it is you telling your story with songs that you wrote. But you're like forward facing and walking through it. Where does that con- where did that visual come from from you to how to, on how to shoot this? The well, because it, it's very visual. It's, I mean, it's very a vis- visual, and that all came from our uh, brilliant uh, Oscar nominated Irish director Michael Lennox. Oh, and, it's it's uh, such a great idea. So, well, I'm I'm delighted that that you liked it and. And that you talked about it—that's that's a real honor. The uh, the thing that I would I wouldn't do just because it would bore me silly uh, is I would not make a movie about me. I would not write a memoir. I am I am totally uninterested in that. What I am I think the reason why you liked it and why other people liked it is because ultimately it's about you. All I did was create a piece of art that you can project your story on, and it it transported you to a time and place that you enjoyed. Some of it was enjoyable for you. Some of it was painful, I'm sure. So it's just, there is just, there's kind of just one story. But when you, when I tell my story, it reminds everybody of their story. And then when story really, stories change everything. And when you forget your story, that's when dangerous things happen and you get lost, I think, you know, as a culture, but as an individuals too. So that's why I'm really passionate about just the concept of storytelling and why we all need to know our story and be able to articulate our story. And, um, th- and that's really what it was. I was just telling my story just so other people could tell their story. But it did start with, in 2014, I was honored to be inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. I gave a 12-minute induction induction speech. And as you know, of all people, everything is not created equal. What For whatever reason, that 12-minute speech got an inordinate amount of interest and plays, you know, it went viral. It was, it was kind of, I didn't really get it. I mean, I was always pleased when people would talk about it. But so 2000... I, you know, I never really knew that there was anything more to it. In 2018, I was really at a very low point in my, one of my many low points in my career where I was just discouraged. Time had passed me by. I don't know how to do this. Why am I doing this? My life has had no meaning. And I got to see Bruce Springsteen on Broadway. Did you by chance? I watched it on Netflix. Okay. Well, it was great on Netflix. It was. I'm sure it was much better. More so. Yeah. And when I saw Bruce, uh, you know, in a little theater on Broadway tell his story, it was all about him growing up in Freehold, New Jersey. And I was immediately transported to 3018 Oregon Drop. It was his story, but he quickly disappeared. And it was my story. And for two and a half hours, I could kind of relive my childhood, my relationship with my father, you know, the discovery of music. I mean, it was, it's just a story, but it engaged me. And um, and then I thought, okay, I want to take my 12-minute induction speech, blow it up, and I want to kind of do a bad version of Bruce Springsteen. So I did Love, Tom. It was a one-man performance, and I did it 100 times anywhere and everywhere. People would – I'd do it for benefits, for charities. I'd have people out to my studio. And How I'd, long was the show when you would do it, one man? Uh, an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. I just enjoyed doing it. 
is one thing that I had control over. Most of the things that I do create, I feel like I have no control over. It's like I can go, I could like come over here and just give me a piano, fellas, and give me an hour and 15 minutes, and I'm going to take you on a trip. It was just enjoyable. Anyway, this director saw my one-man performance. He said, I know how to make a movie out of that. How do you see it? He just, I was doing a performance for his brother-in-law's company. Okay. And uh, he just happened to be there. When someone comes up to you and goes, I think I can make it. I don't trust anybody anymore from Hollywood, you know. But when someone says that to you, do you think he's serious? Because it's such a, it's, it's, well, it's, it's I guess. I mean, you know, I, it, it all comes down to the person. I, I had an immediate affinity for him and, you know, I, I knew he had, He's got a body of work that I respected, and uh, we kind of had a relationship. I mean, my immediate response was, let's do it. When, where, how much, I'm in. I haven't seen the movie in a couple of years. I watched it as soon as you sent it to me, and then I've preached about it, and I, I never watch movies twice. I, I want to watch it again, and if I mess up some of the details, just slap me and tell me the real story. But there's part of it where you're talking about you stop doing music, you're selling real estate? Yes. For, and not for like eight months. For over 10 years, right? Yes. Okay. 13 years. I mean, that's a whole different life. I mean, that's a whole different life. That's a whole right. different. <laughs> that's crazy. And so you call your, da your dad. Is it, what, what, can you yeah, my, remind me so of the story? So my father, whom I loved dearly, uh, the majority of my life, it was, it was idyllic, as I say in the movie. My father had a predisposition towards clinical depression that at times led to uh, an addiction to pain medication. So he kind of got on that roller coaster and then he retired um, and, you know, everything went to hell in a handbasket when he retired. And he was on a real roller coaster of, you know, depression and it was, it was basically opioids, you know, on and off. Mm -hmm. It was prescribed by doctors. Uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, now I've forgotten. What was your question? Uh, the the dad. You're, you're, oh, yeah. Okay. You're, you're living in Texas. Well, yeah, so my dad was not doing well, was in Atlanta, which is where I was from. I was in Nashville. My mother called me and said, I can't do this. And, you know, I could tell by my mother's voice that it was killing her. Yeah. So I brought my father to live with me in Nashville. I couldn't take care of him. My songwriting gaining no traction. My father and I moved west to Dallas to stay with my sister and brother-in-law. I reinvented myself as a real estate broker, leaving Nashville never to return. And literally about, I don't know, five, six years in, I, I kind of thought I'd made peace with Nashville. And all of a sudden, I found myself one day, I was cold calling a shopping center as a real estate broker, and I just... I was talking to a prospective tenant, but internally I was having this raging argument with God about how could I be 39 and be so disappointed with my life. So, I mean, it was really an epiphany moment, and that's when I literally heard, I haven't, I've heard God a few times, and God said, well, you've been worshiping the creation instead of me, the creator. So there you have it. And it was just shocking. When you were selling real estate, were you good? Did you get good? I was, you seem like I somebody was very average. Okay, you keep saying that about everything. I'm, 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 I'm just telling you. I have one thing I do really great. I am, I really am a, a very good lyricist. The, the majority of other things, I mean, I'm, I was okay. I mean, I made a living, but I was surrounded. Talk about you know, supermen, elite in Dallas, Texas at that time. I was surrounded by some of the greatest real estate brokers and real estate developers in the United States, almost the kind of the burgeoning real estate development business started in Dallas. That just happened to be a collection of men that, that kind of built America and they started in Dallas. So I was surrounded by, I'd be like, yeah, I was a pretty good tennis player, but you know, I was with Andy Roddick and, and, and Roger Federer. I did meet Fed a bunch and he was awesome. The kindest guy. I do have one John McEnroe story, which I will tell you at some point. <laughs> it's an amazing story. <laughs> Right. We, but we digress. Um, you are selling real estate again for over a decade, but were you did were you itching to create whatever that meant? Not, you know, I was six, were you repressing it hard? I was repressing it, and 
Um, you know, I I just I kind of just didn't have much I I really wanted to say, and you know I was I was way bitter. I didn't think I was, but but I think in the actuality, I think I was just disappointed um, in yourself or the in system? myself and God in. You know, just in the fact that my father, you know, kind of fell apart at the end of his life, it was just, it was kind of all so needless. It was so pointless. Like, we all kind of had it together. And then, you know, so, I mean, I blame my father for a lot of it for a long time, which was foolish. But when were you reintroduced to fulfillment? I remember I had, honestly, when I had that moment with God, and I thought, okay, you're right. I've been looking down here for years, and you're up there. You allegedly, you know, are the God of creativity. In the beginning, God created. Allegedly, let's just say that's true. Why don't I just go back to the God of creation and say, I need I need a hit of creativity. I just want to enjoy this again. I, I, I did love it at one time. Now I hate it. I just want to go back to... I just want to enjoy it. I don't care if any, I'll never go back to Nashville. I don't want to do that. I want to enjoy this gift. And as soon as I kind of did that, the, some of the weight started to fall off my shoulders. It took about a year and a half or two years. I started to thaw out and I could just kind of start breathing a little bit. And I remember one day, you know, it was the convergence. I was working with Walmart. Bill Clinton was running for president and my father was trying to recover from a litany of things, and I just sat down, and over a couple of weeks, I kind of wrote Little Rock. It was just the convergence of all those storylines, and it was like, wow, that that's what I'm talking about. That's all I wanted to do, and it was just, just the joy of that creation was enough. Okay, so I heard something there. You're talking about Walmart, and you talk about Little Rock selling VCRs that ain't Walmart. Is, I mean, is that reference inspired by that season with that exact I mean, oh exactly that's exact i mean every time magazine every look magazine every newspaper would say bill clinton that kid's on a roll in little rock and i was like every time i would see it i think well that's a song if i was a songwriter i would write that but i'm not a songwriter so i'm not going to worry about that but i did i did park it away and then one day i was like all right, what if I told a story of somebody? The, the, the Little Rock is, it really is, it's biographical. It really is my father. That's his story. He was always trying to start over, draw a line in the sand. I'm not going back to that other way of life. And so really, it's, it's just, I just used all those, you know, that storyline of this, this recovering alcoholic finds himself and, you know, Little Rock, you know, selling VCRs. And he called, the, the whole song is three and a half minutes of this guy calling his wife, con, trying to convince himself and her, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I'm from Arkansas. That song was personal in many, many, many ways. Not only is it, and I have parents that my mom dealt with a lot of addiction, yeah. but also my state didn't get talked about much and it was always bad. Right. So they have a song where they were like, Little Rock, we were like, yeah, yeah. let's go. <laughs> and we're like, that's our song. I think I'm all right. Right. <laughs> right. So you write that song. Did you feel like that was something you had been storing in you? As in, you could have written all these songs. Or did you feel like that was something that kind of replanted in you by something bigger than yourself? Because that's kind of a, that's a powerful way to start yeah. your second, we'll call it your second so, career of songwriting. Right. Well, you yeah, know, it, it was it was a real moment. I think, you know, in the creative experience, I think it's like that. It's 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 plateau, 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 and then then occasionally, and you never really know, occasionally you'll just move up, you know, a few rungs of the ladder and all of a sudden it's a whole lot better than it was, but you had, you just have to put in all that time and you got to be willing to you just can't be defined by failure. Which which I'm oddly enough not even though i am very insecure and very fragile i am not defined by failure i, I can i can handle failure surprisingly well i bet you can too yeah i, I have to because i do it all the time yeah i don't like to fail right my second book that i wrote was called fail until you don't and people have this association with me and failure and that i just like to go out and fail i hate it right but i also i don't like or i don't like exercising either i don't like 
eating pretty good. Right. But I got to do some things in order to actually be better. Yeah. And some of that happens to be you got to know, you got to be okay with how much it sucks when you yeah. can't do something good. Because if you want to do something good, you got to do something not good first. Right. And yeah, it sucks. Failure sucks, but it's it's being okay. It's like in the morning for me. You know, I go in every day and wake up at, sometimes I wake up at two. Sometimes I wake wow. up at, it just depends. It's an early, early show. And I never got used to waking up early. Even today. I went in this morning, did a whole show today. I never get used to waking up early, but what I get used to is how to handle it when it feels terrible. Yeah. I'm better at feeling terrible and hating waking up in the morning. Yes. And that's how I am with failure. I know that, okay, well, that sucks, but I've had it happen before already. I got through it and got better. Yeah. And it's going to happen again, too. That's nothing to do with this failure. Right. So why am I going to spend a whole lot of emotional energy yes. a assigning myself to this failure? Right. And then if I can take something from it, awesome. It still always hurts. It still always hurts and always sucks. But I know there's going to be 20 more failures coming up that have nothing to do with this. And I, this is needed. So I don't get better waking up in the morning. I handle feeling bad better. I don't get better at failure. I handle it better because I've done it so much. I know more will come. Yeah. And I'm, I think that's, I mean, obviously that's, yeah, that's one of the reasons why you're very successful in a number of fields. It's borderline psychotic because like I said, everything's linear to me. Yeah. Like I just lined out A, B, C, D, E, F, G of how I am able to live my life and my feelings, it's still not feelings. They're dots. And I walk to the dots. It is interesting. I mean, you you say borderline psychotic. I mean, I get that, but I'm I think I'm very attuned and sensitive to as a storyteller. I can tell I could I can tell your story a number of different ways. Just this last little bit, so you can you can project that that's psychotic, or you could just say, you know what, you're just very focused, you're very committed, and you're very disciplined. I don't think that's psychotic. All true. But, and you, you, we could do this to your story too, I'm focused and disciplined because I'm terribly insecure and I'm scared of going to back how it was when I was a kid. Yeah. I don't want to have to not eat meals because we can't afford it. I don't want to have to go and not be able to afford clothes or shoes and figure out how to have to just survive. And I'm so scared of that and I'm so insecure with my skill set, which I don't feel... My skill set is pushing yeah. and not stopping that I have developed these other things from those first difficult things. Yeah. And I'm grateful for it now. I used to resent it like crazy. That's why I was asking you about that, you know, bitterness and resentment. I used to be so bitter and so resentful. I didn't have a dad and it was yeah. hard. And But now it's like I have empathy in a way that I would never have had I not had those failures and those struggles. Yeah. And when it comes to struggles and some of your most notable work – for example, I think something you probably get asked about a lot is the house that built me. Yeah, I believe you told me last time it was a seven-year song, and you just kept going back to it. And it was never quite full, finished. And Two questions. One, after all that time, what was it about it that you went, oh, now it's done? Because yeah. I think I would have just gotten to the habit of wanting right. to fix it or giving up. I don't think as songwriters we ever really – have that moment of clarity where you think, oh, it's done. Uh, it was just, an, it's just part of the cycle. Uh, you know, we'd done a number of demos and we did this one in 2009 and it was, we demoed it. It was like, that's amazing. But I thought it was amazing. That was my question. Did you first, also think it the first many times? I've, I've always thought the first, you know, five. So it wasn't you that was holding it back. No, it was, it's, you know, you just have to stay in the process. I, I My one-man performance morphed, you know, probably seven different times over the two years that I did it. it. had all different names, had different parts of it, and I thought it was amazing every time I did it. I thought it was just killer, only to find out, like, oh, somebody would say something, I'd just be crushed and devastated and be like, oh, you're right, That's, mm -hmm. I forgot that. But, again... E equally hurtful and awesome. I have those moments too. Yeah. Where I, my wife says something about it. my stand up actor. I did a one man comedically inspirational show where I'm funny, but I'm also telling stories. Yeah. And she'd be like, well, what? Are, and I'm just so, I'm like wounded when she says it, but I know she's saying it from a place of love. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, it hurts because you're right. And I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm like, oh, this sucks. And you're right. 
So that's like I get it. Like when you say that, you're speaking from my mouth. I had to, I'm, I'm, I told my wife about I don't know three weeks ago. I said, honestly, I don't think I can ever play you another song again. It was so the reaction was so <laughs> honest and so painful. It was I almost couldn't. I was just almost catatonic for about thirty six hours. It's crazy, but anyway, what it's, did you expect? I expected her to love it. Did you expect her to love it, or did you just really want her to love it and want her, even if she didn't love it, to tell you she loved it? I knew she would not tell me she loved it if she didn't. Uh-huh. And, uh, and but I wanted her. You know, I've, I've got an audience. Of one, I'm just I'm still trying to impress my wife. You know, after same, and I'm losing the ability to. The more I'm with her, the less awesome she thinks I am. I'm not even funny to her anymore. It's crazy. It sucks. Uh yeah. But uh, by the way. When you were on Bear Grylls and you all were doing some of those. The one with her or the one by myself? The one was one with her. Okay, yeah, the last one. Wow. Oh, yeah, she's, but she's a monster. She's a beast. That was really, I yeah. mean, the, 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 I'm very scared of heights. Me too. And I just, the way that you all negotiated and navigated that was very inspiring. Yeah, I hated it. Thank you for bringing that up. Now I'm li- reliving that. Thank you. <laughs> what a storyteller you are. Do you have any other songs that are like you've been working on for six years? It's like wine, you know how they age wine or whiskey. Yeah, you've been holding seven yeah. years, do, is doing the seven year deal again. That you think, you know what? Maybe this ver- that you've been on and off working on. Well, I mean, nothing that comes to mind. Um, you know, I mean, Love's the Only House took a long time, and we have many different iterations Martina? of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we had one that was a kind of a Jimmy Buffett Calypso version. We had one that was. You know, a very Elton John string version, and then, you know, we kind of ended up with the version that we have. Uh, but you know, I, I've come to see the creative process for me. It's it's a two cycle process. I create, and I share, and that's really it. Then I have to immediately go back to creating and sharing the next thing. I can't get hung up on. I mean. When we did our movie, I we just sent the movie to every notable person that we knew in the music or entertainment business. That's how you yeah. distributed it early for partners. We were just trying to find somebody somewhere that said, I like this, I know what to do with it. And Yeah, I didn't say that. I said, I like it, I have no idea what to do with it, yeah. so go to the next person. Right. Well, And that, that's, that was the case until we got to Jason Owen and uh, Chandra LaPlume. And how does it get to Paramount Plus, though, overall? Like, the, uh, so Jason at Sandbox Entertainment uh, and Chandra, they have an arrangement with Sony Pictures Entertainment. Sony Pictures Entertainment, uh, they then shopped it to all the different streaming services. It, t- it took them, you know, nine months. Do you feel like they believed in it, Sony, when they were pitching oh, it? Immediately. I mean, it's like once you kind of get – well, there, there's – you know, two things. It's uh, you got to have somebody that has the ability to do something with the art that you give them, and and you also have to find somebody that is passionate about what you do. So, fortunately, we found that in that it was it was an amazing team. Tom McKay in Los Angeles. He was he was just pounding the pavement trying to. I mean, people saw it. And nobody said that's terrible. I don't know what you guys were thinking. It was just. Now it has to fit into the niche. Mm-hmm. Of, I mean, all these streaming services have identities that are so segmented that some like music, some don't like music, some, you know, I mean, they. it just depends on what their tastes are. How was it being front-facing to a camera, having to speak directly to a camera? It's different than acting. It's different. It's just so different than anything in how this was shot and how your relationship with the audience and the yeah. camera. Well, you know, honestly, I didn't really think about that. Uh, it's not like that we set out to – we. I didn't really have any idea what we were doing. I just wanted to do it because it was another form of expression. I like telling the story like that. So I had performed it so many times that I, I knew the mm. script pretty well. And so, you were comfortable with the words. It's your yeah. voice, obviously. So it would just be like plug and play. Like, okay, we're going to do this three-minute segment here – do this and you know I didn't know I could do it but I didn't know that I couldn't do it when I look at it it doesn't look that unusual to me it's only when people 
you know, say, gosh, how could you walk and talk at the same time? That, that, well, that means enough. they had low expectations to begin with a few times. Well, <laughs> They're like, we're surprised you could walk and talk at all, Tom. <laughs> Don't chew gum. Do not try to chew gum with that. Though. Have you found random appreciation for it, meaning from a community that you were not already in and someone just found it and found you and somehow got a message to you? Uh, yeah, it, it's you know, some of those random, uh, you know, I'm not really on Facebook. Somehow I have an account, and but I started getting, you know, flooded with, you know, Facebook from people that I'd literally gone to grammar school with or mm. college with or this or that. And, you know, and occasionally I'll go somewhere and somebody say, hey, man, I really enjoyed your, your film. So, uh, but I, mean, I really am all about the next one. I mean, we're trying to do the next the uh the next one we, we we probably should do love bobby or hate bobby <laughs> <laughs> you have done so much and you're a lot of songwriters like uh, like goal like I, a lot of people said they, their goal has been to get in a room with you to write you're a hero to a lot and some people don't even realize you're the hero till they get to spend time around you or study what you've done and how you've done it heroes influences Two questions about that. One, who was your hero when you were a kid? And then as you became an adult, it could be a young adult, who then, and maybe it was the same person, who then that you weren't related to became your hero at any point in your adulthood? That's a very good question. I was very influenced by, uh, you know, the, the and I noticed that when you asked that, you didn't give any kind of parameters. Pur I know, purposefully. I know, that, I know you did that purposefully. I have a question like that that I ask, and I don't give parameters, so it's always interesting, people's response. So I didn't fall for that trap, Bob. <laughs> but good try. <laughs> I, uh, I was very influenced by the music in my house that I grew up with, which was, you know, Lawrence Welk, you know, a big band music, uh, music of the church, um, you know, I mean, I, I literally remember my sister, my a dad, and I went to Jim Salee's record store in Buckhead, and we bought a 45 of Hound Dog. I, I bet that was 1958. I, I can't really pinpoint the date. But, you know, I, there was always music around me. My father was very creative and very artistic, even though he was a steel salesman, but he was a very poetic guy. So I, I was very influenced by my father, um, and he you know, was always, you know, pushing me on. My biggest fan, uh, and my mother was very creative, but in the design arts. So that, and uh, I, I honestly think maybe everybody thinks this. I think I grew up in the golden era of music. I mean, I grew up. I with think that too about my the era. Beatles. You, uh, you you think your era yeah, is the golden era? Absolutely. Okay. So everybody thinks that, but. You know, I mean, I grew up with the Beatles. I grew up with Elvis. Elvis. I grew up with Springsteen and Dylan and Jackson Brown and the Eagles and Bob, you know. So I was really, that was that was my school. That was my education. That's how I, that was my musical education were, were, were all that music that I just absorbed growing up. Even though I never, I grew up in a time and a place and a family where there was no possible way I would have told my parents I'm going to now be a songwriter. That would that would have been unthinkable. When you got to choose your influences, not even just who you're around. Yeah. I'm gonna ask the second part of this question again. But now you get to choose. Yeah. Who's your hero at twenty five? I had some guys along the way that for no good reason just believed in me as a songwriter. Uh, when I was in Atlanta in the very early days. They just they saw something in me, and they, you know, they supported me financially and emotionally. It was Bob Lee and Bobby Benson, and uh, they really influenced me just in their passion and how much they loved. I loved songs, but I saw how much they, I loved songs because I was creating. They just loved songs, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I I, I, I think that's it. Then that's I, acceptable. I, yeah, I came to Nashville. I was here. And for it was four me. Years. And I came. You heard me for the first time. And you're I like, heard you that guy. Yeah. 
is awesome and I need to be more like him. Yes. Thank you for that. And I appreciate that you say that all the time to everybody. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> I had two final things to ask you. Being in Nashville and you play, I'm assuming you still play some of the, you talk about your show, but you still probably play some songwriter stuff, some music. Oh, yeah. yeah. If they could say, okay, Tom, you're doing four songs tonight. Right. What four will you more than not, what will be your four more times than not? Yeah. What are those four? I just did a benefit for the NSAI on Monday night, and I played four songs. And they, oh, good. I like this. Let's just do the, what you did recently. Then. Good. I started with uh, Van Gogh. I, but I tell these kind of a little elongated anecdotes of, to the songs now. I don't just play the songs. So there's, I play a song called Van Gogh. Then I played Little Rock. Then I played I Run to You. And then I played The House That Built Me. Mm. You got to close with that one, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's the, that's the, it's still, I mean, the people love it, not really because of the song. They love it because they get to take a trip back to their home, good or bad, for about three and a half minutes. That's why they love the song. We do this bit on our show. We've done it for years and years and years, about once a year because we don't want people to know what we're doing. We have a guy on our show just go, it's getting riskier and riskier, but he'll go up to, a house and knock on the door and he'll wow. just he'll just recreate it did he never actually been in the house but he'll just say the words from your song and see if he'll let them in their house wow. and be like i used to live here really? you know, they're all dogs in the backyard you know that and it's so funny because it's just your words that but it's amazing i gotta see that well it's it's i mean it's stupid <laughs> not your song the bit we do because he'll just be like i feel good about it. He'll, yeah, hello uh, i just want you to know uh, and i have thought I, and, and he just does it he acts out your word and they believe him that is and sometimes so they funny. shut the door in his face and sometimes they're like okay yeah come on in and then he's like you know that that tree over there just it's so funny wow yeah he's gonna get shot one day anyway um <laughs> that's what i want to say before we wrap on the last question i i'm gonna watch your movie because i loved it so much and i hope people listening to this if i'm correct the movie is not three hours it's not a marvel movie where i'm just like i gotta pee this was like, is it an hour and 10? It's 56 minutes on Boom. Paramount+. Plus. That's less than an episode of some of the shows I watch. Yes, right. Okay, you guys, go watch Love, Tom. It's awesome. It, stylistically, is going to be a little different than what you're used to, but that's what you'll fall in love with after about eight minutes. And if I'm telling you, I will, it, money back from Tom. I like that, yes. Now, from you, not from me. I Rebate, <laughs> somehow. A Diet Dr. Pepper on me, if you don't That's like a lot it. of Diet Dr. Peppers, though. We got, we got a big audience here, Tom. <laughs> uh, final question. What would you have for lunch today? Oh, man. Uh, I have had the same thing for years and years and years. I will say, and you could you can talk to people that have written with me. I have a, I have a whole thing. It's a turkey sandwich. It's good, thick, whole grain bread. It's mustard and mayonnaise. That's it's disgusting. boar's head honey maple turkey, All right. American sharp cheddar cheese. Today, I always have one special ingredient. Today, I put cranberry relish. That's pretty good. I like that. The mayonnaise kills it, though. What? God. Man. Mustard and mayonnaise together. Are you a serial killer? Yeah. Wow. That, you want to see my lunch? Check it out. I had this today. Yeah, put those on. This is my lunch. And I usually do you Instagram all day. what you have for lunch. Well, I did today because look how dynamic that is. What is that? Chick fil A? No. Chick fil A. <laughs> what is that? Chicken and waffles? It's a it's called a chicken breakfast plate. And there are there's chicken, there's waffles, there's biscuits, there's uh fruit, there's uh bagels. Where's that from? I'm glad you asked. Here in town. My wife was like, Do you want to go have lunch? And I'm almost done for the year. Like I got a couple I think this is like my last thing thing. Wow. Yeah, I wanted to Really end on a on a, a low a, note. On the, <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, "Let's go have uh, let's go have lunch." I said, "Sure," and it was Anzi Blue, A N Z I E Blue, right down there, where like Hillsboro. No, it's where all like the college kids walk, and people the biscuit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know how to get to work unless I have to turn my GPS right. on. But it's Anzi Blue, and it's awesome. Wow, but that looks delicious. It is. I couldn't eat. It. I mean. I'm not, I have stomach problems, but I had I had the pl whole plate there. I ate some of it and called it a day. Wow. But it was amazing. That was my lunch. Thank you for asking. I like that. Yeah. You didn't ask. That's all right. Who cares? I Chris, should have asked. That, look, the movie's awesome. Thank you. You're very kind. We've done an hour here. Yeah. This is an hour. A great hour. I enjoy spending time with you. We haven't even started recording yet, so that was just a warm-up. Yes, We're going to now get you. to oh, yeah. the action. Mike, so hit Were record. Were we actually recording this? No, no, that was just a warm-up. Now, oh, now that's the pre-interview. 
Yeah. Anyway, we're able to talk, and I talk like this in the interview. Yeah. We're able to Tom Douglas, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I hope people check out Love Tom. I love Tom. Just so much. It's so good. Paramount Plus, go get it. Tom, it is always a joy to spend Thanks, any sir. time with you whatsoever, especially when they're, it's just me and you. Well, I would say uh, God bless Bobby Bones. Mm, I would not say that, but I appreciate right. that you did. <laughs> uh, congratulations. Check out Love, Tom, and that is all. 